Hi, I'm Nikki Lowe, and welcome to the Wisdom for Working Mums podcast show, where I share insights and interviews that support women to combine their family, work, and life in a more successful and sustainable way. Today, I'm exploring a topic which affects women no matter what their status, culture, religion, age, race, but it's an issue that is often misunderstood. And that is the issue of domestic violence and domestic abuse. How would you know if a colleague, friend or family member was a victim? How would you know if you were a victim? Because sadly, many women aren't aware that they're experiencing it until it reaches a crisis point. This is such an important topic for us to talk about because it's often cloaked in secrecy and shame. And domestic abuse is not just a private matter, but a public one. We all have a responsibility to put an end to it. The purpose of this episode is to raise awareness so you can understand the role that you can play in spotting it and helping to safeguard others. In this episode, I'm going to be speaking with one of my coaching clients who has been a victim of domestic abuse. I first started working with her when her organisation offered coaching to their employees who were working mothers during lockdown, really to help them navigate the challenges of the p- pandemic. We've protected her name in this interview to prevent any repercussions from a perpetrator with whom she still co-parents her children. We've given her the name of Kim for the purpose of this interview. And Kim was keen to share her story with us as part of the Domestic Violence Awareness Month, really to help others. When Kim first shared her story with me during our coaching time together, I was shocked. It was the first time I'd heard someone explain their experience of domestic abuse. And what struck me was that it can happen to anyone. Kim is smart. She's an MBA graduate and she's a professional woman working in IT. She doesn't fit the stereotype of a victim that I'd unhelpfully held in my mind. And... She didn't realise she was actually a victim of domestic abuse, which, if you listen to this episode, will come out as a theme and really quite a shocking theme. And that's something we wanted to highlight in this interview. You never know who is experiencing domestic abuse and abuse can take a range of forms, which is why raising awareness is such a crucial thing. And most importantly, we can all play a part in ending it. We're also joined in this interview by Representative Pam from my local domestic abuse charity, The Haven, which supports women and children who are victims. They do amazing work providing services and activities support women and children, including a 24-7 helpline, safe accommodation, support for those living in the community, advocacy and advice and specialist programs, counselling and therapy and children's services. And whilst this topic may not be one we want to listen to, we can't turn our back on it as we leave behind the women and children who might be at risk or currently facing domestic abuse. So I urge you to listen so we can all come together to end domestic abuse and be empowered with the knowledge of what we can do. And I think it's really important to say that if you're triggered by anything in this interview, the first part of call would be if, firstly, if you're an immediate danger please call the police. If you're not in immediate danger, look at contacting the National Domestic Abuse Helpline, which you can be reached on 0808 2000 247. But let's dive into this really important conversation and welcome our guests. So welcome, welcome Kim and Pam to the podcast show. And thank you for joining me today to talk about this really important topic. Thank you for having us. So let's start with actually getting into the detail, because obviously we're here to talk about domestic abuse and domestic violence. But what are actually the statistics on this? What do we know about its prevalence in our kind of society today? Gosh, um, thanks, Nikki. So there are a few stats that um, I can share with you on the prevalence of domestic abuse. For example, um, according to the Office for National Statistics, one in three women aged 16 to 59 will experience domestic abuse in their lifetime. Um, two women are killed by a current or former partner in England and Wales every week. And um, in the year ending, I think it was March 2018, 
women were nine times more likely than men to be killed by their current or former partner. Um, in addition, I'd, I'd like to also share some alarming st statistics, um, which speak to how much work we still need to do as a society to not only create an environment that does not silence victims of abuse, but to also ensure that justice is served. Um, according to a Safe Lives report, 85% of victims sought help an average of five times before they were able to receive effective support. And the Office for National Statistics tells us that only 6% of reported cases in the year ending March 2019 were prosecuted. So, yes, um, we have a lot of work to do. Wow. Those are some powerful statistics. So actually, you were saying one in three women will experience it in their lifetime, which is a huge, huge kind of percentage. Well, and there's also, three of us here. Yeah. <laughs> wow. And that so, two women when you are think killed. about it that way. Yep. Yeah. And it's interesting because the statistics you shared there, some of those were pre-pandemic. And I was sat thinking, I wonder how much the pandemic has impacted those statistics as well because that must have been kind of the perfect storm for this as well yes it absolutely was it absolutely was we saw a huge increase in the need for our services as well during the pandemic and what i'm hearing there is as a society even though it is so prevalent actually getting prosecutions getting people to take this seriously as you say there's still a lot of work to be done yes so let's just get clear, because one of the things that I was looking at as I was researching for this recording was the the actual term domestic abuse and also domestic yes. violence. And I wonder if you could just talk to that about actually what do we mean and what's the difference between those terms? Sure. So historically, it was in, in 1973. Coincidentally, the same year that the Haven was founded, by the way, um, that the term domestic violence was first used to mean violence in the home. Believe it or not, um, this was previously classed simply as civil unrest. Um, this term, domestic violence, in a similar way to the term battered women, which I most detest, by the way, um, because terms like these um, were used when there was less understanding of what domestic abuse really is. And they implied that there had to be a physical attack, possibly um, with visible scars. And we know that this isn't true. So domestic abuse is a more blanket term that refers to any incident or pattern of inc incidents um, that constitute controlling, coercive, threatening behaviours, as well as violence between those aged 16 or over. Okay, that makes sense. And I know as we get into Kim's story um, and you share, Kim, your experiences that you'll be really telling your story about the experience of this. So you talked there about the common forms of domestic abuse, which was controlling, coercive, some more the kind of emotional and psychological abuse as, you know, in that kind of broad term, as well as it might be physical? Yes. Okay. And I, and I think this this is such a great question, by the way, you know, just talking around what what is abuse and, and what does that look like? Because um, as obvious as it seems, we know from speaking to women at the Haven that many do not even recognize some of these as abuse while going through it. Um, and, and the legacy of using terminology like domestic violence and, and battered women, for example, is that it was not until 2015 that coercive control was recognized as a form of abuse under the Serious Crime Act. Oh, wow. Um, I didn't realize it was that recent. Yes, 2015. Wow. So, um, things like, uh, um, uh, you know, psychological, emotional abuse, um, financial abuse, um, tech abuse, I think we can say a bit more hidden because they're not out there. It's not, there are no visible scars. It's not easily recognizable. And, um, it, it's good to have these conversations. And, and I'm, I'm, I'm happy that women like, um, Kim are 
actually coming out and sharing their stories so that other women can see themselves in that and it can help them to recognize what they're going through as domestic abuse. Yeah, and I think that's so important because, as you say, often many women aren't aware that they're experiencing abuse because, as you say, there's not a bruise or a, you know, a physical wound to to kind of make that really clear. And I know, Kim, when you approached me to say, look, I'd like to share my story to raise awareness, that was something you were you were really keen on as about actually – you know, and thank you for sharing the title for this podcast, which, you know, love, love shouldn't hurt and doesn't hurt. And I think that's really important. So, Kim, can you take me back and, and, and share your story with, with my listeners about actually your experience, perhaps where your relationship with your perpetrator first started and, and when you began to realize things weren't right? Yes, great. Thanks, Nikki. So, um, as Pam mentioned, I was one of those people who didn't know about domestic abuse or domestic violence. Um, I just assumed that relationships, some were good, some were bad. And so yeah, I just didn't understand when I went into relationships that I could potentially be a victim. And so when I met uh, the perpetrator, um, I was open-minded, and surprisingly, when we first met, we met online, which is, I know, some people were like, oh my gosh, you met online? That should have been an indicator. But, you know, it's it's kind of like, well, again, you have the best intentions, and you hope that others also have the best intentions. So we met online. It wasn't anything serious in the beginning. I was just looking for a tutor, and I just thought, great, you know, this is is going to be wonderful. Uh, I'm going to get some tutoring, and and that's how it started. Um, but then what what happened after that was we were connected. It seemed like everything that he was saying was so amazing. We had so many things in common, and and that's that's what got me. And and I have to say, I wasn't a young woman when this happened either. You know, I was later on in life. I'd already gotten a master's degree and finished a four year degree and I had been working. And so I thought that I was finding like a catch and that finally I'd be able to start a family and have kids. And I met this amazing person. But um, quickly that I started to realize that we didn't really have a big, long courtship, as people would say. We only dated for a few months and and we decided after that, that, you know, we're, we're older people, things are going well, we want to be together, we should just get married. And I thought, yeah, you know, that's great. Let's do it. And um, it could have been a wonderful story because all of the things leading up to that was so magical and so wonderful and just swept up in the moment. But quickly after we got married, um, I started to realize that things weren't all as they seem. I was very lonely in the relationship. I'd done a lot of sacrifices in order to make this relationship work. And it seemed like no matter what I did, it was never good enough. And I wasn't good enough and nothing in the relationship was good enough. So in the beginning, I just thought, well, you know, yeah, you know, I've never been married before. I I can't figure out what's going on. And maybe this is just what it's like your first year of, of marriage. So and in that, was there verbal criticism? You know, when you say that, you know, whatever you did wasn't good enough and that you weren't good enough, was it, were you receiving kind of criticism from, from this person? Yes. You know, it wasn't really criticism in the beginning. It was just the negative responses. Okay. So, you know, like kind of when you're like with your kids and they do something great and you're like, yeah, good job, you know, like, oh, wonderful or not even great. It, it, even just, you know, someone's done something, someone's made you something, someone's given you something, you acknowledge it and the effort that they've put into the things and stuff like that. It was just that it was very much none of that was coming my way. I was I was feeling isolated and by myself and. I was, we were together, we were two people in a relationship and there was nothing. It was just silence. (laughs) So yeah, I was not getting any, any feedback at all. 
and it was very sad at the moment when I was realizing this. But what I'm hearing you think was, oh, well, I've not been married before. Maybe this is kind of normal and we've got to work our way through it. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And I, one time, so throughout our relationship, there was a lot of back and forth and things weren't going well. And we were at a crossroads. He got a new job somewhere and we needed to move. And I remember thinking, Oh, I've been married for a year. This is like not going well. I should just, I should just leave. I should just get a divorce. I shouldn't go. And I just went back to this. Well, you're not a quitter. You know, you can't give up on this and you've got to keep going and, you know, try harder, try better, try more. And I have to say, like, looking back at that moment, I was like, man, if I would have done something different, my whole life could have been different. But yeah, I I did have a moment there. Almost like a sliding door moment, I imagine. And what I'm hearing you say is probably what so many women listening to this or recognize is that try, try harder driver. Or if I just try harder things, you know, my job will get easier. Or But that was applied kind of in your relationship about, oh, actually, I'm not a quitter. I've just got to keep trying. So what, so what then happened? What did you notice from that point where you was like, no, I'm going to stay. I'm going to try harder. What happened then? Where does this kind of story lead? You, am I right in saying you hadn't got children at that point? Yes, there was no child. There were no children at that point. So, and that's why I always look at that moment, like what that, um, that, you know, I was just like, why, why did I not just decide there? It wasn't good. I knew it wasn't good. Something was wrong. I couldn't. And I think it was that something was wrong and I couldn't pinpoint what it was. And because I was not aware of of the trickle effect, basically, it was a trickle effect that over time, things just compounded and got worse. So that was only the beginning of my my sad story. You know, I, I we moved. I had children. And it didn't just stop with, you know, me being isolated. There were lots of other things financially. I couldn't take care of myself. I was dependent. And even when I had a job, I was still dependent. It was very interesting how I couldn't make decisions for myself and for my children and things that I thought I needed to do for them and in a unit. Um, I, I didn't have access to friends or family. And then that's when all the criticism started about, oh, I was being a terrible parent and I was being a terrible wife and I was a terrible person. And just everything about me was, there was nothing good, nothing at all that the perpetrator could find that was good in me. And so five years of that and um, yeah, you just, you just become a shell of yourself. And so it, during that time, what would other people have noticed about you? So from the sounds of it, you were isolated from your family and friends, but you'd got a job and I'm assuming you were, you were going into your place of work. Yes. And I was thinking about that this morning and the way I can describe it is you, comp you compartmentalize. So, and this is one of the reasons why I think more women need to talk more about their experience because I think from the outside, my work colleagues and people like that, they wouldn't know because that was the work me. So the work me was, was different. I wouldn't talk about things that were like not good at home or that I was lonely or that I was stressed out or I wouldn't, I would just, that would be home. Um, but my family, they had a better idea because I would be more open and share more about the home situation. And they saw me losing weight. They saw me stressed out. They, they were really concerned at, at one point, especially after I had my second child, they were really worried like if I was okay. And at the time, yeah, I was really busy with my children and I, I wasn't able to focus at all on myself. So I think I lost like maybe three or four kilo and I'm already a small person. So yeah. Was, yeah. So let, if you're willing to, and I know this is obviously a difficult subject, but I know you're really keen to share this so that other people can learn from your, from your painful experience. 
What were some of those experiences of your domestic abuse? So I hear that there was kind of financial control, that even though you were a highly educated, you know, career driven woman, you no longer had kind of financial independence or the ability to make decisions. What were some of your kind of day to day life experiences like living in that kind of relationship? Oh, yes. So after I had children, it was it was like I had no choice. I could I couldn't I couldn't escape it, and not I didn't know actually still at that time that there was something wrong. But I just knew that I couldn't I couldn't leave. Um, I didn't have any money, you know. I didn't have any friends, and I just felt very much alone. That number one, I thought no one would, no one would understand what I was going through. No one would understand what it's like. So one day. The perpetrator came home and I had the two kids all day and we'd done stuff. And he said to me, you know, this place is not clean. And I was like, I spent the whole day. I knew he was coming home at some point and I'd cleaned up. I I was doing, that was all I was doing was in preparation for him to come home. And he went to the windowsill (laughs) and he pulled back the the curtain and was like, look at all this dirt on this window. And I just couldn't believe it. The whole entire rest of the apartment was clean, you know, with two small children under five. But that's what he, he, it was that, it was the windowsill that was causing him problems and he'd just only come home from work. So the the Kim that I've got to know through our coaching work together would now, I imagine, speak up and have a voice back to that comment. But if you go back to the Kim that was then, what what went on for you at that moment to, when they when they said that to you? Oh, I was just like I like. <laughs> I, firstly, I w- I couldn't believe it because, like I said, I'd spent hours cleaning with the kids around. You know, it's difficult. They're making mess and just trying to. Every time they would make a mess, I would clean it back up and just trying to get everything. So I was like, wow, no, he's right. I didn't clean the windows, so I guess I have to add that to my list next time I know. So there's that thought that you're wrong and you're not good enough. Oh, yes, absolutely. Well, I was told that. I was told that. One of of the favorite phrases of the perpetrator was, I was like a shrimp. Everything was good except the head. And sometimes they'd make these little fish faces because he said, you know, he sometimes he would look at me and I just look look like a fish just in the tank with my lips opening and, you know, getting water and just being like, I don't know, um, mindless. I guess that's what he was trying to say. I was mindless in my day to day. Wow. I notice kind of my heart feels really sad hearing hearing that and hearing your experience. So... Talk me through, because I know you've shared over our work together, some of the other experiences that you've had around gaslighting. And I, I, I don't know, I don't know if you can speak to that or maybe Pam, you can as well about actually what is gaslighting and what was that experience like for you and, and give some examples. Sure. Maybe Pam, would you start with just what gaslighting is? Um, yes. Gaslighting is a, is a form of, um, psychological abuse. And it, it it sort of makes you as a victim question your own sanity and and almost you know making you it, it, the the perpetrator makes you believe that things are not happening the way you you say they are and and they make you doubt whether um, you're really going through this experience or whether you're making it all up in your head in your head and I think another thing that um, Kim mentioned, which which would be good to mention, is the the love bombing that can happen at the beginning of some of these relationships that end up becoming, you know, controlling um, relationships with a lot of gaslighting. You know, they spoil you, um, give you everything to make you rely on them and become dependent on them, only to then use that to um, to control and and abuse you eventually. Okay. Yeah. So that that's the pattern that's that's yes. seen a lot: the love bombing at the beginning, and then how then that then turns into something a lot more sinister. Yes. 
Thank you. And so from your perspective, Kim, what were some of your experiences of gaslighting? Yeah. And it was so interesting because I didn't, at the time when I was going through this, I didn't know that there was something wrong. So there was a, we had a microwave in the kitchen and every day it would move every day. And every day I would move it back. Like, what is, I don't understand. Why, how is the microwave moving? Like, is it, am I going crazy? I don't know. But every day I would move it back. This happened. This was going on for like a whole year, a whole year. The microwave would just be random and it would just be moved and I would move it back. And and I would just be like, I don't understand what's going on. So you have to understand by this point, it was really, it was a really terrible time. I'd already been in that relationship for quite a long time with the two kids, isolated, no family. So I just really was wondering if I was going crazy or not. And some of the things the, the, the perpetrator would do was I would go into a room and he would turn out the light. I would turn it back on. He would turn it off. I would turn it back on and he would turn and we would do this until finally I would just be like, well, fine, I guess he wants the light off. then." But that was like a normal occurrence. I, I never, and you know, the thing is, I don't, why didn't I ask, why are you turning out the light? I don't know. I just never did. I'd be like, well, I'm just going to go and turn it back on. And I never confronted. I never asked questions. I never like st- stood up for myself. I never asked about their microwave either. When, and it was crazy after I'd left the situation two years ago, um, my son came to me and said, mom, do you remember the microwave? And I was like, yeah had a microwave. He's like, yeah, dad told me he was moving it. (laughs) I was like, right. Hmm. Right. But what I'm finding really interesting hearing you talk is that the, your voice was absolutely taken away the power to kind of go, Oh, why, why, you know, ask the question about the light, about the microwave. That wasn't even an option at that point. I didn't, and I hadn't even realized that I, I just, there was just nothing that fight or the question or the challenge, it was completely gone. There was none of that happening for me. Was there fear as well? Or was it? So great question, Pam. Yeah, no. So interestingly, towards the end, towards the end of our relationship or whatever you want to call it, um, I, I did start to get worried because he would make these threats to me. He would tell me that, you know, I needed to be afraid of him, that I shouldn't be afraid of God. I should be afraid of him. And if I ever thought I was going to leave him, then I would have to, uh, he was going to make me pay. And I think maybe he must have felt like there was a change or that something was going to happen because that was really around the time that we were starting to, the whole situation was starting to unravel. And I was starting to realize that love doesn't hurt. And, you know, that this wasn't right. Something was going on. And yeah, so there was a time where, oh, it's a terrible story, but I'll just share it. Basically, my my daughter was watching a movie um, with the perpetrator and he wanted to watch something so inappropriate. It was about a young girl who was not even a woman, like having this relationship with an adult man. And I was like, no, we're not she's not watching this. Like, I'm sorry. This is an adult movie. She's a little kid. She's going to her room. We're going to go do something else. And he was so angry that I said no. And I was taking her away that he followed me to the bedroom. And like, he was yelling at me and just saying, you know, what am I doing? Who do I think I am? And I grabbed my son. Oh, it was terrible. And I was just holding him. And he's like, you're holding my son because you don't want me to hit you. And that's when I was like, okay, this is, this is not right. This, um, this has gone completely terribly wrong. And yeah, I wish I wouldn't have done that. But that was one of those things where I just, I was afraid for myself. And I knew that I was hoping that if I had my son, that that would be some protection. But actually, you know, after learning more about domestic abuse and domestic violence, I know now that that's while that in that moment it 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 worked it doesn't always work and that you could really put your child in danger so 
Yeah. Mm. Yeah. But I also hear, you know, the need for real compassion in that moment because you were doing the best in a really, really terrible situation and a survival mechanism kicked in that you you can't hold shame for. But I hear what that was really a crisis point for you where you were like, actually, this relationship is not is not safe and is not okay. Yeah. That was pretty much towards, that was like starting to be the beginning of the end, um, which was what, great. Yeah, that you were realizing that. But I think that was a really great question, Pam, because what I'm hearing is that actually the fear of the physical violence wasn't there until towards the end, even though this was not an okay relationship. But I, I think she she spoke to that earlier when she said she didn't even recognize that what she was going through at the time yeah. would be considered abuse. And I think you'd find that her story resonates with a lot of women because if that's exactly how it is. The patterns unfold and um, there, there usually is a point of escalation before you realize, ah, okay, this is not right. Yeah. And so what then happened, Kim, because I know that there's there's actually quite a powerful story that then happens after this. Mm-hmm. So there was at that point you thought, no, this this is not okay. How long did it then take for you to actually leave and what was that process like? Yes, yeah, so that that was one of quite – there were quite a few other instances that really pushed me to, to, to leaving after that. And one of them was, and I didn't know at the time that the perpetrator was was planning something, something was changing, something was happening. And there was this incident where he, I don't know, my son was crying or something and he was upset about something and the perpetrator got his phone out and was recording me with my son. And I was, and I happened to be on the phone with my sister and she said, call the police now. And that was really the turning point. And that was about, I would say that was about six months after that incident where I had my, my son and, you know, the, the perpetrator was threatening me. So about six months later that, that I really knew, and it was when I was speaking to a female police officer and I was sharing all the things that had happened and just letting everything go. And at the time, the perpetrator, he left. Um, and I was like, oh my gosh, he actually left. I called the police and he left. I couldn't believe it. And that's when that was really the the true, true turning point. Because at that point, I could not, there was no going back from that. The police officer was telling me that I needed to get help and I needed to, you know, do some things to, to get out of the relationship. And that that kind of started the the trickle effect of me trying to do things to to get out of the relationship and i have to say it was it was a challenge but i did it i didn't have any money i didn't have any family or f- i had a few friends here who were who were helping me supporting me through this but i basically had to just leave with my with my two kids and so when you say leave was that the the marital home yes that's right okay And at this point, if you think about your work, was anybody in terms of your your work colleagues or your manager, were they ever aware that this was going on by this point? Oh, yes, they were. Because before I left, so that that whole six months or so, I was still working. And I just, that's a great, that's such a great question, Nikki, because some people really helped me out there. I wasn't sleeping. I wasn't eating. It was a really terrible time, and um, oh, sorry, I'm getting upset. And they would just let me come to work and sleep. And I would do some work, obviously, but I really needed sleep. Because I still had my kids. Yeah. And the situation at home was really, was really terrible because, you know, I knew now I couldn't, I couldn't, I 
had to face what was in front of me. And that meant, yeah, that there was some difficult tension between the two of us. And, <clears throat> you know, he was, he was also doing things that I didn't know that were happening. Basically, he was saying that I was abusing him and making these long journals of just made up stuff about me and how I was, I was the one abusing him, which, which wasn't the case. And I didn't, I didn't know that until later on, but yeah, there, there, it was a really tricky situation. And I'm so grateful for all my work colleagues at that time because they were so understanding. I didn't have to explain it to anything. I, I just told the one guy like, look, I'm, I'm really struggling at home and you know, that's, that's all I had to say. And he was supportive. Oh, that's incredible to hear because I think we've got many hopes from this podcast episode going out, but one of those is that somebody listening might have somebody on their team or a colleague that they work with that you don't know how much of a lifeline you might be for somebody. And you might be the only person that's picking up the signs of this if they're isolated from their family and friends and how important your response will be. Absolutely. I definitely agree with that. And I do hope that, you know, that maybe in this, in this work that we're doing now, that more employers would feel inspired to get some training for their staff, at least one person in HR or someone that could help to recognize the signs and then to also be able to be that person. Mm. And there was something else you said about your perpetrator trying to make it out that you were the abuser. And I was just wondering, Pam, how common is that kind of experience in people's stories? It is It is quite common. I mean, I think what I'm hearing from Kim is the um, the willful calculation, knowing that, you know, you're doing the subjecting this woman to all of this harm, but at the same time, having the time and the presence of mind to build your case and your your story and excuse. Um, this is something that we see see a lot, and and this is one of the reasons why I I feel as though we need to change the narrative around domestic abuse. A lot of times, when women share their stories, you hear people ask, "Well, what did you do?" Or you see people excuse domestic abu uh, domestic abuse um, as a result of um, alcoholism, or maybe they were having too much stress at, at work. Um, there is absolutely no excuse for abuse, and I think when you hear stories like it, like this, you realize how calculated some of these perpetrators can be. Yeah, and I know that. Once you made your decision to leave, which must have been so difficult, the journey continued to be difficult for you in terms of you've, you share children with this person. And so there was a whole court experience. And I wonder if you wouldn't mind speaking to that, Kim, about sharing as much as you feel comfortable to. Oh, yeah, that's, that's a great story. And I have to say that once you leave, it does take some time in yourself to build yourself back up. And that, um, you know, I, I worked on myself a lot. I, I, whatever therapy or counseling or talking to people that I could do, I did a lot of that because I needed to be able to strengthen myself, to be able to work, to take care of my children now as a single mom. And then, and then <laughs> I didn't know it at the time, but to be able to continue on this journey because when you have the children, you're still connected in, in a way uh, to your perpetrator. So yes, um, after I'd left, I guess he was still angry and, and upset because I, I think one of the traits of perpetrators in these domestic abuse and domestic violence situations is that they have to be the ones in control. And so when you decide to do something, that you've done on your own and without them and they, and they're angry about it. Well, they, they don't like that and they want, they want you back. And, and Oh, uh, Nikki, just before I go there, I just want to say that it was a scary for myself after I'd left after the first 
I would say the first three months because he would follow me around. He once I we, we would hand over the kids and he would follow me through town or he would be somewhere. And a lot of times I had to go into stores and say, listen, I'm going to stay in here because that man is following me. And so it is, it is really important for women that after they leave, that they know that they are at risk for those few months, especially if it's something that they've done themselves, that they've decided they're going to leave because the perpetrator usually isn't happy about that. And Kim, I don't know if you could say something about that, if, if you've seen that as well. Yes, Kim, absolutely the case. Um, and I think it's so important that you, you brought that up because a lot of times, you know, we hear people ask, why didn't she leave? And people assume that, you know, it's easy to just pack up and leave, leave or, um, you know, access support, et cetera. But we know, um, from, reports that have been published from research that has been done that a lot of times women find themselves at risk even after they leave an abusive relationship and there have been quite a few cases where women have been murdered by the perpetrators after they've found the courage to leave the relationship. Mm-hmm. And I think that's why the work that you do at the Haven is so vital And we will come on to talk about that in a minute. And I just wonder, Kim, in terms of how this story then progressed, because as you said, it sounds like once you left, there was still this ongoing kind of threat and control. I wonder if you could speak to a bit about your court experience. Thanks, Nikki, for bringing it back there. So, yeah, I, I think the court experience was just a form of lashing out. It was when, when I think about it, because I just moved out, I didn't really have very much money. I didn't have my family here. And the fact that he felt that he needed to go to court, the perpetrator was beyond me. He, he didn't have to, but it was this, you know, that he was angry. He wanted me to pay. I didn't pay enough, I guess, in, in, in his mind. And that was, that was what he wanted to do. So it was a whole year of court. And for what reason was he trying to take the children? Yes. So his court petition was to take my children out of the country. And I didn't want my children to leave the country. Mm -hmm. And, um, in the court during our trial, He brought his family. They said, oh, they would take care of me. It would be wonderful. Uh, They didn't understand why I didn't want to go. It would be great for the children. Everyone would have this wonderful life. And that's when I really got the courage. And it wasn't my, I, I did have courage in that moment, but it was when I was reading what I was writing and preparing to a friend. And she said to me, why don't, why are you not saying you're not going? Why are you not saying you will not be going to any other country. Your kids live here. You're staying here. You're staying here. That's it. And I was like, yeah, why, why am I not, why am I not saying this? I don't know. I, even that, in that moment of me going to court and it turned out I had to go to court, um, after spending so much money, the, the last two days of the trial, I, I couldn't afford a lawyer. So I had to prepare everything myself and, defend myself against a London, a London lawyer, um, in a two day trial. And that was one of the key points in my, in my argument that, well, whether or not my children go somewhere, if the court allows it, I will not be going. And I have to say, looking back, some of the things that I would have changed is I didn't realize because, uh, I, I did know that I was abused. And I thought that by me leaving or somehow that that would be an indicator of my abuse, but actually it wasn't. And that if I had to do again, I would have definitely made a stronger case for the fact that I was abused and that's why I left. And I, I, I want that to be on the record, but at the time I, I I didn't really think about it. And my lawyer at the time said, well, it was a male 
And he said to me, well, you know, do you really want to go down this road? And I don't know, I was getting legal advice from him. So I thought that surely he would know best. But if I had to do it again, I would say, absolutely, you must stand up for what happened to you. And to to have it have the court recognize that that is what's happening because it will have an effect. Well, it should have an effect and hopefully it does have an effect on how they see your situation. Wow. And I hadn't realized that. I hadn't realized that you'd not spoken about the abuse, but luckily the court found in your favor. Is that right? That the children they couldn't did. be taken. They did. They did. And I, I don't know. I mean, I'm I'm a believer in spirituality and I'd been praying and doing lots of things. And I think this whole journey, I've been helped and protected by other things other than myself. So even after all that, I've spent so much money. I still was able to manage to leave, to have a good relationship with my children. It's not what I wanted, not at all, but my children are not, they didn't leave this country, which was, would have been the absolute disaster for me. And I'm finding a way. Yeah. And I say, luckily, the courts, and it shouldn't be a matter of luck, should it, Pam? No, it shouldn't. It shouldn't. But um, as the stat stated earlier, we still have a lot of work to do in terms of um, ensuring that victims of domestic abuse receive justice through the court system. Because what we're finding is a lot of times women don't even want to bother um, going through the court system because they feel like they're, they're being victimized by the court. And it's a harrowing experience to have to relieve everything you've been through and to come at the end of it not feeling like justice has been served or that you were believed or that, you know, your your situation or your story was taken seriously. Yeah. So, Kim, from your perspective, what do you want other women to know about your experience? Yeah, there's a couple of things. I want women to really understand that love does not hurt. And that was one of the things that was part of my like awakening to the fact that my situation wasn't good. There was this advertisement. And I remember it because it would just come on random times and I'd be listening and it'd be like, do you feel ashamed? You know, like, are you hurting inside? Are you walking on eggshells? And I'd be like, yes, I would. I'd be like, yeah, that's me. And they'd be like, well, you might be, um, you know, in a domestic abuse situation. You might be in a bad relationship. You might need to get some help. And I'd be like, oh, no, I don't know if that's me. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I would say that, you know, it might be you if your love is hurting you then you you might need to to think about what is happening and to actually put yourself first i know it's that's so difficult in many situations but if i had not done that i would not have been able to leave because i was saying i can survive it i remember 2016 I, it was the new year was coming in and i was doing yoga to try to bring in some happy energy and i just was laying there saying I think I can do this another 10, 10 or 10, 15 more years, I think. I think I can. Come on, you can do it. And I was miserable saying that to myself. I was like crying and trying to figure out why, why am I saying this? So I would say, put yourself first. Go and speak to somebody. See it, why the love is hurting. And know that by doing this, that you can find freedom. And I didn't realize at the time how much more important freedom is to me than anything. And Kim, what, yeah. Sorry, what, what you speak to there as well is, is the denial that a lot of victims face. Um, and, and that denial can take different forms. It can take the form of um, deliberately lying and to cover up for the perpetrator because you're so scared. But it could also be... Um, and I'm not sure whether this this was the case for you, but a situation where a lot of women never think it would happen to them. You know, you just feel like it could not this it could not be my this could not be my story. I'm successful, I'm intelligent, I'm you know exposed. I should know better. This can't be me. And I think 
one of the takeaways from this should be that it can happen to anyone. It can happen to anyone. There is no marker that indicates who can and cannot be a victim of domestic abuse. Um, and of course, people just need to be aware of that and to, to look out for the signs and, and know how to recognize those signs. I think that's a really, really powerful point, Pam. So obviously the purpose of this conversation is to raise awareness and also empower all of us about what we can do. So what are some of the practical things that we can do to help support someone who might be experiencing domestic abuse? And I'm going to kind of give us two two kind of tracks here. So there's if we might be that colleague that you had, Kim, that you they recognize you what you were struggling at home and want to support, what are some of the practical things we can do there? But also if this is somebody listening that says, actually, I can relate to some or all of all of that story. What happens if I might be a victim and I hadn't recognized it? So uh, I think the whole world needs to become a zero tolerance zone. Um, and we all, every one of us need to ask ourselves, would we know what to do if someone disclosed that they were being sub subjected to domestic abuse? Um, I know we've talked about the workplace scenario quite a bit. So I, I just want to share another stat with you that I'm not sure many people are aware of. 75% of women who experience domestic abuse are targeted in their place of work. Yet, only 5% of workplaces have a domestic abuse policy. So, how do we make the world a zero tolerance zone that's safer for women? We need to believe disclosures of abuse and take them seriously. We need to be supportive and not dismissive. It is not your place um, as a colleague, as a friend, you know, as a family member to request proof. Leave that to the right authorities. You need to be able to reassure, um, you know, whoever it, the victim is that you are aware of the impact that domestic abuse may have on, for instance, their performance. Um, if, if it is a, a workplace disclosure and signpost them to the, the support that's available. Um, at the Haven, we, we usually encourage work, workplaces to focus on the three R's, recognize, respond and refer. Those are the three R's of safeguarding, um, um, victims. So recognize is, you know, helping them recognize what the signs are, making sure that when, um, you you're hearing the disclose disclosure you're listening out for those signs and then you you have to respond with um empathy um by believing you need to be supportive and then referring is making sure that every workplace should have um you know information about local services that are available local um organizations like the haven for example that women can contact for support. So making that available and making sure that um, you have that to share. And sometimes you don't even have to wait for the disclosure. It can be a thing where you just make that available, either as part of a training session that you give. I mean, we've, we've found that a lot of the trainings we've done, we've had disclosures take place right there and then with women recognizing suddenly what they've been going through as a result of going through the training. So that's, that's really important for people to think about. And, um, I think we, we need to ensure that victims have access to the right specialist, practical and emotional support, like those that we provide at the Haven, um, be it counseling and the therapy, be it access to safe accommodation if it is required. Um, and we need to also encourage men and boys to talk openly about their thoughts, their fears and emotions so they do not have to resort to violence. Because I think there's a, a culture that we still, um, well, a culture that the, the patriarchy upholds where, you know, boys are not encouraged to, and men, 
feel as though they, they can't be emotional, they can't express. And I think we need to try and move society away from that if we're going to create a, a safer world for women and children. Really powerful there, Pam. Thank you so much. So what I thought we'd end with is just really some signposting about if someone's listening and they need more information support, where would you point them towards? So we have a couple of um, resource guides on our website, havenrefuge.org.uk, that I think um, your listeners may find really useful. Um, The first is a domestic abuse guide, which shares information to help you recognize the signs of domestic abuse. And we've also got a safety planning guide, which shares information that you would have to consider as a victim if you're thinking about leaving an abusive relationship. We've also got a health and wellbeing guide, which is um, some useful information on how you can improve your mental health if you're feeling worried and anxious. So if you visit our website and search using the search um, button for any of those, you will um, be able to, to get access to those pages i'm sure nikki you'll share the links as well um there's also a very useful website which is award-winning by the way um our website you matter um which shares stories um from women real life stories from women in a similar way um to how kim has shared her story today because we recognize that a lot of times women identify with other stories and and find the courage then to seek support when they can see how that has unfolded for other women and and how they've been able to come through at the other end so there is you matter which will help you also to recognize um signs of abuse and if you set, search the hashtag haven a to z h a v e n a to z a t z t o sorry z on um, ha- um, Instagram, you would come across a series of posts, um, which are our A to Z of domestic abuse. And again, it shares useful um, descriptions and meanings of key terms that you may come across, some of which we've discussed here today, and also ways, you know, practical ways that we can help um, move the world towards um, a safer place and move towards a world where, where Vogue is perhaps, well, Violence against women and girls is perhaps um, a thing of the past. Amazing. Thank you. And I know you also go into companies and and do training on this for for actually organisations. You know, that stat that you said there about only 5% of workplaces have a policy and and are able to support. I know that there's really great work that you do in that area as well. Yes, we do. So um, anybody who's interested in exploring that can contact us. We provide... um, training domestic abuse awareness training as well as other um, specialist training we also um, support businesses with um, developing their own domestic abuse policies Um, so that support is available for for anyone who needs it and i think it's it's very important that you know people listening in consider if you're working in an environment where you're not aware that any of these things are available, perhaps have that conversation with HR, or if you're a leader in, you know, a workplace where there's a need for this, please reach out. We'll be more than happy to help you. Fantastic. And I know that you also, before we hit record, you you mentioned about the National Domestic Abuse Helpline that I'll put details of, but you also said that if anybody listening, if you're in immediate danger, just please call the police. Yes, please. Thank you both for kind of giving a voice to this really, really important topic. And Kim, for you sharing your story, which I know must be still incredibly painful, but I know that you've got a purpose to to want to help other women. Oh, yes, absolutely. Thank you, Nikki, for letting me share my story. And I hope all the women out there and men who might be listening to this, that they um, will have some more information. We'll be able to use it to help friends or family members, or colleagues. Thank you. And Pam, thank you to you and the Haven for the amazing work that you do in this world. It's 
It's so needed, unfortunately, but you must be the lifeline for people when they need it most. Thank you so much for sharing your platform with us. And just in case there's anybody listening in um, that would like to make that call now, um, I'd just like to share the number for the, the National Domestic Abuse Helpline, which is 0808. 2247 or our um, 24 hour free helpline is also available on 08000 194 400. Amazing. And I'll put those into the show notes as well. Thank you both. If you've enjoyed this episode of Wisdom for Working Mums, please share it on social media and with your friends and family. I'd love to connect with you too. So if you head over to wisdomforworkingmums.co.uk, you'll find a link on how to do this. And if you love the show and really want to support it, please go to iTunes, write a review and subscribe. You'll be helping another working mum find this resource too. Thanks so much for listening.